Hello. Um, I'm Silke, I'm a co-director at Startup Grind in Zurich, and I have the honor to introduce our next speaker here on stage, who's going to talk about how to scale your startup. He managed to build a Scottish unicorn who aims to make sports more exciting and entertaining. So how did they do it? What made them pivot from a news predicting service into and go into daily fantasy league sports? How did they manage to go from a team of five in Edinburgh and a humble user base to become an American sports giant with 360 employees in Scotland and in the US and over six million registered users? They managed to overcome the rejection by over 80 investors and still managed to close a total funding of $375 million by big names such as Google Capital and um, Time Warner. So how did they do it? We soon find out. So please join me in welcoming Nigel Eccles, co-founder and CEO of Fanduel, and my colleague Alex from Startup Grand Barcelona. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, hello, hello, hello again. Thank you, Nigel, for joining us today. Mm. I'm impressed by all these people here. Thank you, for thank you for coming. Well, we'll talk about how to scale a startup, right? You sure. guys, let's get into it. You yeah. guys started in Scotland. Yep. You needed to do the flip to the US. Yeah. So I wanted to say, like, how, in retrospect, would you have started directly in the US or? For us. Yeah, so no, absolutely, I'll answer that. Just before that, I, I wanted to tell the audience a funny story. So I, I've been, when I came to this building, I was surprised it was a, it was a hall, because I've been here before. It used to be a court. Um, and so I was in court here uh, about 15 years ago. I'm just hoping today goes better than that day. <laughs> but uh, no, I was just a juror, and, and we let the guy off. It was fine. So, but th bike your question. So, yes. Yeah, so our company, Fangio, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a fantasy sports business. Um, and we launched in the US in 2009. We've grown incredibly quickly. Uh, we've grown to several million paying users. Um, last year, we paid out over one and a half billion dollars. So. Pretty, pretty big company in terms of headcount over, over 300 people. Uh, our product up until very recently was uniquely a US product. Um, even though the company was launched, and we still to this day are a Scottish headquarters, our Scottish company, although we moved our headquarters to New York in 2011. For us, it was very important to us to build a company in the UK, and particularly in Scotland. Uh, that was really important to us. In retrospect, Building a U.S. product in the U.K. when the U.S. was our market almost certainly made it harder for us to do. Now, that doesn't. Now, now what I'm not saying is it's harder to build a, a, a company in the U.K. than it is in the U.S. But if you're building a U.S. product, it is almost certainly do, easier to do it in the U.S. How much in terms of revenue you're getting out of Europe as opposed to what you're getting from the U.S.? What's the distribution like? So today, like we have launched a sort of a beta product in the U.K. But the U.S. North America is 99.9% .9 of our revenue. Well, so, that quite explains. Yeah, they kind of why it'd be better to be there. Actually, one of the things that we have learned, or I have learned when I was doing the research to prepare for this interview, and you also have found through third parties, is that this drag wall marketing strategy, mm -hmm. right? Can you explain a little bit what that is? And because you didn't seem to know about yeah. that, and yeah. how did you use it to your advantage? Sure. So yeah, if you look at our Wikipedia page, somebody looked at our marketing in 2015 and and, uh, and did this analysis and said what it was, which was kind of news for us. Uh, it wasn't what we set out to do. So really, the background was as a company, uh, we had developed a product, a fantasy sports product that. Traditionally with fantasy sports, you pick a team and you play, you keep the same team throughout the entire season. And so you, the game lasts three, four, five months, which to us just felt unfeasibly long. Like we for a millennial who's used to playing, you know, Zinga poker or used to playing like a you know, social game, like five minutes is a long time. Uh, the idea that you play a game that takes like four months we thought was insane. And so we said, well, why don't we take the seasonal product and collapse it down to one day. So I pick a team, play that team today, and if I win today, I win. Next day, I pick a whole new team and play that team. Um, so that was in 2009 we launched that product. And we got, within about a year and a half, two years, we had very good product market fit. The players that discovered the product loved the product. And we started going talking to people more broadly in the market, sports fans. What we discovered was the, the people that knew about our product loved our product. The problem was the vast majority of people just didn't know about our product. So when somebody converted the product, they stuck with it. They said it was amazing. 
we just weren't growing fast enough. And there's, there's a fallacy that some entrepreneurs, um, particularly in tech, get stuck on is like, if you build it, they will come. Um, I, I don't know if that was ever true, but it almost certainly is not true today. Um, you can build an amazing product. The, the you know, history of innovation is littered with the best product that wasn't successful because it wasn't successfully marketed. And so what we really discovered from sort of 2011 onwards was that we needed to get very good at marketing to basically to, to explain to the people that would be target customers, particularly fantasy players, why Fangio, why Daily Fantasy Sports and Fangio was better than what they played, what they, what they knew. And in doing that, because that was so successful, then we managed to really ramp up our marketing to, to quite a significant scale. Actually, you were, um, you were certified as one of the highest growing companies in the US, mm -hmm. and that probably was because you invested heavily in this advertisement marketing yeah. and all of that. You did it because you started off with a great amount of capital, this amount of capital. Mm -hmm. would you have done, what would you have done if you hadn't had this capital from the get-go? Yes, so we did, and like, uh, uh, to date we've raised over 450 million, so we have raised a lot of money, uh, but that was not the true at the very start. Uh, we found it very difficult to raise capital. I think our first venture round was a million dollars, mm -hmm. um, and that kept us going for about a year and a half, two years, and then the next venture round was like four million. Um, the reason we could raise money was because we used that small amount of money to prove the marketing channels, to say, look, I spent 50,000, 100,000 this marketing channel, I acquired a user for $50, that user's worth $500. So if you give me 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 10 million, 15 million, I can, I can acquire a user for, it went up slightly, but 50, $60, and that user lifetime value will retain at that high value and so, from an investor perspective, it's a clear arbitrage. Users clearly love the product. You're acquiring efficiently, and therefore, let's invest. Um, and it was only once we'd really proven that, you know, were we in a position that in 2015, where we raised around 300 million. But we wouldn't have been able to raise it had we not been able to prove what we could do with that first sort of one, two, and four million. And one of the things that you really nailed is actually having all these partnerships with pretty much every NHL team, NBA team. Mm -hmm. But you told me you spent almost two years without getting any deal yeah. with them, yeah. right? Once you got the first one, yeah. then the, the last one's cool. followed, right? Yeah. How did you do it? How, how does one create partnerships with yeah. NHL teams, for yeah. instance? You know, so we, we started with zero relationships. Um, and we, uh, we, we looked at the teams as a way to build our brand and a way to legitimize the product. Um, we felt that, you know, to be, we were a marginal product. Uh, fantasy sports was kind of a bit looked down upon. Um, and we felt that the only way we could become mainstream and legitimate is to partner with the teams. And so we started knocking on the doors, I don't know, maybe 2012, 2013, probably 2012, but it wasn't until 2014 that, uh, that we got an in with the Orlando Magic, which is one of the most innovative uh, NBA teams. And the NBA is, in my view, the most innovative US sports league. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we think this is interesting. We think we can do this. And they had to take it all the way to the league to say, we think this is good for sports. We want to work with these guys. And that was a multi-month process. We got to the end of that. We got a deal with them. And when that was announced, we not only got the deal, but we also changed the league policy towards the category. And then suddenly, you know, there's 29 other NBA teams. And so suddenly, uh, we were, went from the position of you know, knocking on doors and getting no word to suddenly we went, from, we went from one team in the summer of 2014 to uh, 30 teams by the summer of uh, 2015. So one, we, from two years to one team, and then from one to 30 took one year. That's amazing. Actually, I, wa I wanted to ask, what was your value proposition for these teams? What could mm -hmm. Handel bring to them? Yeah, so like one of the big ones was around driving engagement in sports. Uh, sports is, a, is an engagement business. They, uh, what they are there for is they want to put an amazing show you know, on, on the court, uh, on the field, and they want people to be really engaged in that. And what uh, particularly the NFL discovered was that fantasy sports is an amazing way of driving engagement. There's so many people will say to you, say, yeah, I would never watch the Jags or the Jets, but I have that quarterback. And so suddenly they're watching that game. NBA was somewhat left behind in that because fantasy basketball hadn't taken off. And so they were like, look, we want to help these guys and we want to really build fantasy basketball so that we get the same benefit. So even if somebody's not a fan of, say, the Magic, 
you know, if they have got uh, Oladipo or Vivucevic, then they would be, they would follow that team because they, they have that player. And actually, likewise, on a related note, uh, you have to deal with a lot of different teams who have got a different perspectives mm -hmm. or even cultures and everything. But you, have, you face the same problem when you expand it all around the states because all the states are different. They have different yeah. legislations concerning yeah. your field, your specific yeah. field. How did you deal with that? And what was the most problematic one, for instance? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, like the U.S. is a, an amazing market. It is a market of 400 million people. It is generally very homogeneous, um, certainly compared to Europe, and you don't have the same language barriers. But for certain products, and ERS is one of them, um, state law is much more important than federal law. Um, and so we really are regulated at a state level. And even when, in the early days, we only operated in 45 U.S. states. It was five that our lawyers felt the laws weren't, uh, they weren't as clear enough as we would like in order to operate there. And so when we went into like 2015, um, we started to get very big and suddenly we started to get a lot of regulatory attention. And so then we moved from being a sort of marketing organization to having to shift much more to focusing to talk to legislators, talking to you know, attorney generals to try to explain the product and how this was an evolution of fantasy sports, how this was good for sports, how this was very popular, very popular. And when you say to a politician, very popular means it is voters that, uh, that use it. Um, and they got it. You know, it, was, it, was a, it was an uncomfortable process at start, but actually once you started speaking to legislators, we had a lot of success. So we've changed the law now in 12 states. So we operate in around 40 states now. Um, but in 12 of those states, what we've managed to do is really clarify the law. Because we went in and said, look, we think the laws are fairly clear, but there's ambiguity there. Why don't we go in, clarify these laws, and put in consumer protection rules that we believe should be in there. And so we've actually gone out and found legislators who actually say, yeah, we get it. We see this is really popular. We see these laws are why they'd be important. And if the industry is supportive of it, we've managed to change the laws. And that, that's, that's like employing like a national lobbying group, but actually going yourself to, like I was in Springfield two weeks ago, which is the capital, state capital of Illinois. You know, I've been in, you know, Albany, I've been in uh, Sacramento, Richmond. You know, these are all the state capitals that if your product is regulated at a state basis, you will get familiar with. Actually, one of the other things, I mean, there are many advantages of going to the U.S. to expand your company, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, more access to capital, you've got everything happens mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, you've got this homogeneous market, et cetera, et cetera. Probably for your specific field, uh, the legislation is way more permissive as it is in the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. Was that also a reason, and would you advise people to go there just because the legislation is more flexible? Um, for us, actually, that Europe's more of a patchwork, and what we discovered is the U.S. is a bit of a patchwork as well. Like we going in, actually thought that federal law was was where the action was at, and what we discovered it was actually more state law. It really depends on your product. Um, it, you know, different. You know, there's certain things in the U.S. are much more tightly regulated, like alcohol sales in a lot of states is very tightly regulated. If you have a, you know, if you're an online off license. I actually it can be quite difficult to set up in the U.S. compared to, say, in the U.K. Um, th there's just, it really depends on your product, what the right market for us. For us, fantasy sports was, had like a 50-year tradition in the U.S. The people, there was a 40, 30 to 40 million people played it, and they were passionate about it. And so that was really more the reason why we went there as opposed to the sort of regulatory regime. Nigel, let's talk a little bit about culture, because we know that when you scale things up, culture breaks. Yeah. It's a well-known fact. Yeah, yeah. How did that affect your company in the mm -hmm. light of recent events with other super high-growth companies? Yeah. How did you deal with that? Yeah, culture is one of the most difficult things to get right, um, and it's one of the things that is a, a silent tax in the organization that you don't realize until further down the line when you get it wrong. So let me sort of explain that. Um, one of my advisors uh, actually said to me during you know, some of the more challenging periods of our company, and I was having to make some difficult decisions, and you know, particularly around somebody who was a performer but wasn't a cultural fit. And he said to me, he said, you know, a lot of people think of culture as what is our values, and we put those up on the wall, and that's our culture, and we talk about that. And he said, that's generally not your culture. He said, your culture at the end of the day is what you accept. Um, what are the, the decisions whenever you're like, look, you know, in the short term we need this guy, but you know, he 
you know, like in Uber's case, is he misogynist? Like, you know, they, they're seeing this now. Um, he is, you know, in some way is damaging from what I believe that the company should be. And if you accept that in the short term, you're accepting in the long term and you're creating a culture. So people now see that sort of behavior, even though I as CEO say that's unacceptable, I've accepted that and it's clear that that is, is, is what the culture is. And despite what you put up on the wall and despite what you say in the company call, you've really role modeled what you see as acceptable and that, that becomes your culture. So th that's one of the most important things to culture. There's really three things to culture. It's who you hire, it's who you promote, and then it's what you accept. And then part of that is then who you fire. Like, you know, people that, you know, deliver but do not, do not fit with the company culture, that do things that you think are unacceptable to company culture, if you don't remove them, you've actually changed your culture. What's well, actually your company culture? Mm -hmm. Can you explain it to the audience? Yeah, so um, our company culture that we set from very early on, very, one of the very first values that we set was openness. We knew that this was going to be a challenge. We knew that the odds were stacked against us, and we wanted to, particularly in the early days, welcome people who were entrepreneurial minded, who were willing to take a risk. Um, and the deal was they were willing to take a risk. If it works, it worked out. But the other part of it was we were going to share the journey with them. We weren't going to go, we weren't going to turn up one day and say, look, we couldn't raise any more money. It was total shock. We're done. We kind of said when we were going through that journey, look, we're out pitching. We feel good about it. But just so you know, like, you know, we run out of money in like two months' time. You know, and, and that, that's, that's kind of scary when you've got your hiring engineers that, um, that, you know, maybe they weren't qu quite signed up to it. But what I'll tell you that did was when we then got to scale and we went into real crises, the people that we had from the start, they were rock solid. Because they were like, we've been through these crises before and we got through them. And they also, they also knew that the company wasn't being secretive about the, the bad stuff. The bad stuff, we told them. We said, hey, here's the bad stuff. You know, and it's very much, here's the bad stuff, and this is why I'm still confident we're gonna get through it. But the culture of openness was, was probably one of the most fundamental things we had at the start, and I think actually what really helped carry the company through the challenging points. One couple of really quick questions. You've done merging and acquisitions. How that impact your company culture? Because not mm -hmm. only growth affects that, but also bringing external people to yeah. your team, that affects your culture. How did you solve yeah, that? Yeah, so, yes, it's definitely a real challenge to culture. You're bringing in a preformed team uh, that uh, may or may not fit with the company. Um, we've, we've acquired three to four companies, uh, depending on how you count them, and some of them worked amazingly well, and some of them have not, and the differences between the ones that worked was the ones that worked, um, they were, we were acquiring people of, who were like-minded, have very similar entrepreneurial culture. Um, those are the ones that worked really well. Um, the ones that didn't, um, you know, they, maybe the culture fit wasn't quite there. Uh, the other ones that didn't work was more of a product issue. Like we bought a company for a product they had. You know, funnily enough, what, what sometimes when that, we actually, in one instance, shut the product, but want, we kept a lot of the team because they were like, hey, these guys are great. The product didn't work, not their fault. We really want to bring these people into the company. Last question, because we've got half a minute, but mm -hmm. you know one of our core values is helping others before yeah. helping ourselves. How can we, all these people here, the whole community of Startup9, help fund you? <laughs> um, if you have any contacts in the, in, the, in the Federal Trade Commission, we're under review at the moment. Uh, please give them a phone call. Um, so we're, we're currently in a merger process with, uh, with uh, DraftKings, which was historically one of our competitors, and um, so we're, we're going through a approval process at the moment. But no, like, you know, I think, in, in my view, I, in our, my journey, we've been, uh, so many entrepreneurs help me, like people who never, never thought would help me, um, and I just reached out to them and said, hey, I have this question, can you give me an answer? Um, and so I just think entrepreneurs should help other entrepreneurs, and I've always tried to do it. Um, it's not easy, and so the only thing, the way to help us is, is help other entrepreneurs, and that, that's what we want to be doing. Nigel, thank you very much. Keep them rocking. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.